um, thank you all for taking some time and um, joining us. I know that everybody's really busy, especially right now, and um, kind of working in unusual circumstances, as are we. For those who I have not met yet, my name is Casey Shiley, and I am the new Youth Services Consultant. Uh, whenever Jana retired last year, I took over uh, the FLIP program, um, and so I'm still new enough to say I'm new. And I also have my supervisor, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. So I'm Dorothy Frank. I am the Florida Electronic Library Administrator, and I'm also standing in um, as, a, as a volunteer to be the Library Statistics uh, Program Consultant specifically for um, grant-funded programming. My boss, Claudia Holland, who is the Bureau Chief, is uh, also volunteering to be uh, uh, helping the, the library statistics program and she's doing the annual statistical report for public library so we're, we're splitting it up and i'm here as uh, a help to to casey to try and answer statistical the statistical side of your summer reading question so we're going to jump into make it count flip summer reading statistics um so by the time we get done today uh, you should understand why we're collecting statistics and what we use them for, what you can use them for locally. Uh, we're also going to talk about which statistics we need from you. And there have been some pretty significant changes to the statistics from what everybody has submitted in years past. And that's in large part because we completely understand that many libraries are having to rethink how they are providing summer reading programming this year. And we really want to make sure that we are capturing that data because we want to make sure that you all get the credit for all the work that you're doing. Um, that being said, this particular webinar will really be focusing on the statistics. Um, I know that I've been getting a lot of questions from people asking about how um, other libraries are handling restructuring their programming. We do have three virtual brainstorming sessions coming up over the next week. Um, so if you're interested in having those discussions, please join us for one of those. And while we'll talk a little bit about programming, we're using them in this webinar more for the purpose of showing an example of what we're talking about. So we won't really spend a lot of time talking about sort of this uh, redecorating of summer reading programming. Um, and then we're going to take a look at Counting Opinions, which is the program that we use to collect the summer reading statistics from everybody. So we're going to talk about why. Why do we need statistics? What do we do with them? So on your local level, these counts actually determine the allotment that you get in order to buy some of your summer reading materials from the Collaborative Summer Library Program or CSLP. Um, we actually take those numbers that you send us, we throw them in a formula and that's what determines that, that money. Um, but they do much more than that. So, you know, these numbers help you on your local level talk about what your library is doing and how you're impacting your community. And that's information that you can take to your local commissions, your local uh, community leaders. And then as staff responsible for programming, being able to track these numbers is really helpful when you're trying to decide what programs are really popular and what resources are really popular and needed for your, your patron base. So another thing that we're doing with these statistics that you send us is we use them to see what's happening in your community. We take a look at the successes that you're having uh, in your local community and we compile them together to get a whole state view of what's going on with summer reading. Sometimes it helps us to see what's trending, what's popular around the state, 
it's popular in your particular community. Um, and the other thing is, is so Casey just talked a little bit about the allotments that you get for the summer reading materials for the um, CSLP Collaborative Summer Library Program material. And those are funded by the Library Services and Technology Act. And this is a federal grant fund that is granted to the division by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, it, this federal funding is provided to all of the states and the territories by IMLS, and all the states actually do use it for summer reading somehow. They don't always do it the exact same way across all of the states, but they do have some kind of a summer library program funded with the Library Services and Technology Act grant fund. And as a result, IMLS has required to have some standardization for statistics so that they can take a look at the nation as a whole. They can see what the entire nation is doing with summer reading and the Library Services and Technology Act grant fund. And this national view then gives the Institute of better way to show Congress what impact the federal funds are having on summer reading. When they can show Congress this impact, they can make a case for continuing to fund the LSTA grant program. They can continue to talk about and showcase what libraries are doing to help the summer slump, help um, children and families throughout the summertime, and just to show how important libraries are. So, it's a really good method to take what you're doing at a local level and take it all the way up to the federal level. And when you tell us the success stories, we report your success stories to IMLS. And sometimes they will showcase little tiny success stories, little tiny snippets, because telling a story can really go a long way to boost what folks are doing at the local level. Talking about how the summer reading has helped John Smith down the street connect with his children or his grandchildren or or you know any of the different things that libraries do every single day, all summer long, in fact all year long. And the and IMLS takes these stories and, and uses them to, to showcase how amazing libraries really are. Any questions about what we do with the statistics or why we collect them? Okay. And I know we've put it in the chat, but just to make sure I say it out loud, we are recording this webinar and we will be emailing it out and putting it up on our YouTube as well. All right. Okay. So we know that there will probably be some changes in how you're going to be doing summer reading this year. Um, the uh, challenges that folks are facing currently, um, and even when libraries start to open up maybe over the summer, you may be considering how to do programming that will reach beyond the library walls. You may have touched uh, some new ways and try, tried some new ways um, during the last couple of weeks where libraries have really been curtailed at their ability to do face-to-face -face programming and being able to be inside the library walls. And you may have discovered that you can continue to provide services to people who can't come to the library and, and that there's new ways of providing services that you may want to continue even if the libraries start to open up. So one of the things that we really want to do is help you collect statistics on all of the programming that you'll be doing this summer for summer reading. So let's start with active programs. Um, for those who have done statistics in years past, um, you will notice that there is really not a lot of changes as far as active programming. Um, you know, active programs are programs that are intended to happen live and in front of an audience. And so, um, you know, there really is not much difference. The only difference that we really want to make sure that we are um, 
putting out there is that virtual programming does count as active programs. And so we know that a lot of libraries have been doing live story times through um, different social media platforms, and that is an active program. And so, um, you know, a lot of libraries are finding ways to take programs they normally do in person and moving them to a digital or a virtual space. And so those programs still count. You still get to count them. Um, they are still considered active programs. So one of the new things that we're going to count this year is we're going to count statistics for self-directed programs. What is a self-directed program? A self-directed program is one that is intended for your patrons to be able to access whenever they want. It's an activity they can do themselves at home. They don't have to have a library staff member leading the group or interacting with them. Uh, self-directed programs are not live. They don't happen in real time. They can be as simple as a PDF coloring book that someone can download off of your website or a program, a self-directed program can be a complex and interactive program like a Google Docs escape room or a Twitter challenge held over the course of a week. It could be a Facebook photo contest or a video that you create to post on YouTube. Those are all considered self-directed programs. And Sarah asked, does virtual include both live programs and recorded ones released on YouTube? Um, and Sarah, we are going to um, talk a little bit about that as we move through this, but I did just want to acknowledge that we did see your question, um, and you should have some clarity on that here in just a few minutes. So Casey, I just wanted to say that we're talking about self-directed programs and once upon a time, we used to say um, that we collected passive programs, passive programs, and we, then we changed our minds about passive programs. And I wanted to say that self-directed does include passive programs. So passive programs are going to be counted this year. Uh, the thing about self-directed programs is that they aren't all necessarily passive. When you think about just, say, for example, a PDF that one downloads from the internet or, you know, the, your, your website and, and uses as a coloring sheet or have you, that, that does sound like a very passive program. But there are some really amazing interactive self-directed programs that are out there. And so we're gonna take a look at a particular set of activities that can be what would be called maybe a passive self-directed program, um, change it out a little bit, and it's an interactive self, self I can't even talk here, self-directed program. So let's talk about take-home craft kit. You put a take-home craft kit out on a, a cart, out at the front of your library and you send out a note to everyone on Facebook and Twitter and say, hey, we've got these great craft kits, come get one, take them home. And then folks come in and they pick one up and they take it home. And I would say that would be a passive program. You don't know for sure whether or not they have done the craft kit, they've come by, they've picked it up, they've gone home. And you could, I would count that as a, a passive program and that the attendees would be the number of kids that you have sent home, have, have people have picked up and taken home. But an interactive self-directed program would be, say, this take-home, the same set of take-home craft kits, and then you would record an instruction, instructional video. You would put it up on YouTube, for example, or Facebook, and then you would accept um questions in the, the the chat section or the comment section and then when you have your time when you, you can get to them 
you would take a look at the chats that have come in for the last, you know, couple of hours or the last day or so, answer those in chat, and then go on with your day. So it's it's a, there is some back and forth, but you don't necessarily have to be live at a certain time. You're still interacting with your, your audience to some extent, but you're not doing it live. Does that make sense? Just well. Now here's one thing that I do want to say. Self-directed is self-directed. If you don't know whether it's a passive self-directed program or an interactive self-directed program, they're all going to go in the same spot. They're all going to go into the same, I'm going to say, statistics pot. So if you're a little confused about whether it's passive or interactive, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, the biggest difference is being able to differentiate between self-directed and active. And so taking that same take-home craft kit program to turn that into an active program, you know, your library could say, hey, come stop by our library Monday through Thursday, pick up a take-home craft kit, and then join us at Friday at 2 o'clock for a story time and a live demonstration of the, the craft. So again, that activity is being done in live time in front of a live audience. But there's still sort of that self-directed element to it. And so I want to, um, we're getting quite a few questions. Let me, I want to make sure we're, we don't miss anybody. Um, Amy asked, it sounds like if I have a scheduled Facebook story time, do I count live views as active and any, any follow-up views as self-directed? You do, and that's actually coming up on one of our next slides. So um, I'm glad this is making sense. We've had a yeah. lot of conversations about this on how to explain it in a way. And yes, yeah. counting opinions will differentiate and you'll see that in a, a little further, um, a little further when we start showing you some screenshots. Uh, does that count as two different programs? Yeah, I want to I want to jump in here, Casey. So if you've got a live program that you're doing live, and you've got live views coming in, you would count that as a, an active program with an attendance of live of a live audience, and you would count that live audience. You pop it onto YouTube as a video, a follow-up video. That would be a, a passive or inactive or self-directed version of a self-directed program because it's, it's on YouTube and then views of that would be attendance to that self-directed program. You get for one one thing you get two bangs for your buck. Does that make sense? <laughs> so and I, Sarah, we've got to okay go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, and Sarah I was said, say, so for that, we would count the activity packs that go home with patrons as self-directed and the live views as active, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see that someone says, do I separate the likes for June and July or is it the whole summer situation? It is the whole summer situation. Let's see, boy, we've got a lot of questions. What else do we have? Um, so I think if, too, if we keep, um, cause we do talk a little bit about the virtual and how to count and how mm -hmm. to pool. So I think if we, um, we see the questions, I do want us to keep moving forward. Cause I think we're going to end up answering a lot of these questions we're getting. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then if we don't, we'll go back and, and have folks, um, I think Casey did mention that there's just two of us on here. And so if we don't actually see every single one of your questions, don't be afraid to repeat it if we if we haven't answered it for you, especially at the end when we have um, a space for questions to come in. Because um, the, there are questions that are coming in and we are working at home on very small laptops that we may we may miss your question, but we don't want to. So so don't be afraid to repeat it, please. 
Um, so virtual programming, so again, just to reiterate, um, your attendees that show up during a live event, whether that's a live story time, um, a live book club in a chat program, those get counted as active programs. So any post event or recorded views do get counted under that self-directed programs. So as, as Dolly said, we get, you know, a little more bang for your buck, um, but those will count in the after. So the live versus not live. So if, if you're new to live streaming, um, and you, you may not be sure how to gather the statistics. Each social media platform is a little bit different. They, they use slightly different terminology when they talk about the same thing. Um, but you should be able to see how many people are watching a live stream during an actual stream on your screen. And even if you can't get to it, like during the live event, you usually can access the number of live stream attendees after the live view has ended. Now, one thing that has been uh, being discussed a little bit is if you're you're looking at your live stream, um, you don't know how many people are watching at each login, at each view. So if, for example, you're sitting, I'm going to say this right now, this is a live show right now, it's a, it's a webinar, and if there are more than one of you in the same room, I hope you're six feet apart at least and are, and are doing proper social distancing. Um, but if you could drop those numbers into the chat, we'll know that there's two of you. And that's the sort of thing that we encourage you to do as well. If you've got a family coming in for a, a children's uh, literacy story time or something and, and it's a live thing, you may, you could count it as one, but do you know for sure it's one? Is it, is it, a parent and a child, is it two parents and a child, is it three children? So if you ask and get that number in the chat, you can add those together. Um, otherwise, I would suggest just using each, you know, login uh, as one. And Somebody. then, um, oops, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't see it. So the program is getting counted twice. Wait, no, I, I haven't. I'm not seeing the question. Sorry. Oh no, you. Oh my goodness, you are, we got some people coming in. Yeah, you are just. Okay. Um, you are just about to answer a question that's been asked. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the I think what I'm saying is um, differentiate between the folks attending the live version of the event and the folks that are viewing the recorded version of the event. So there, the live stream attendees would be counted as having attended an active program. And then viewers of the recording would be, and I'm going to do air quotes, would attend the self-directed program. So they're both virtual, and if it's a live stream, then it would be an active virtual program. And if it's a, a recorded view, then they would be attending a self-directed virtual program. And then most social media platforms that provide recorded video hosting also provide analytics that you can download uh, for a range of times. I know, for example, in YouTube, you can pull the whole month or you can pull the whole summer in one fell swoop. So we, we do recommend for your recorded video views that um, you, you, you pull for the entire summer. Don't forget it's for the entire summer. And uh, go ahead and keep, keep tabs on those views and, and be sure to pull up the whole summer up to right before you submit the statistics because that the whole thing counts right up until that very end date. So, um, and that is the nice thing about self-directed programs. You get to count the whole time, not just right, right exactly when you pull it up. And we got a question saying, what if your city says no live events? Um, 
you know, ultimately that is a local decision, but I think the benefit of us adjusting statistics is that you will still then get credit even for your non-live programs. Whereas if we had sort of stayed on the course, we would have had to figure out a whole different way to get that information um, because we just know things are so different right now and there's no one way one way of doing things and so um you know if you are not allowed to do live events don't worry about it we when it comes time for us to sit down and figure out how to divvy up these allotments we are not going to penalize anybody uh, because of things that are outside all of our control. Um, you know, even last year, even though the whole state wasn't impacted, we put in certain measures within our um, allotment formula so that areas that had been really heavily hit by hurricanes, so obviously their statistics looked a lot different, we made sure that they weren't penalized for that because that's just beyond anybody's control. So what we really are hoping is that this is providing a way, if you can't do live programming, but you're allowed to do non-live programming, that you're still then getting the credit and you're still able to tell that story. And, and I see that there's a question about how do you count, how do you count the live views, which I realize is a slightly different question, but. Um, and I, I would say any way you want to. Um, this one is a suggestion, do a, uh, do a Google form or have them indicate how many viewers. Now it does, the question here, let me read this to you, Casey. Could you have them sign up, view a Google form, for example, to a scheduled live stream and in the form ask them to indicate how many viewers in the family and their ages? That's up to you. I think, um... I think one of, again, ultimately a local decision. I think my question would be, how do you then guarantee that they actually attended? Um, so, you know, again, ultimately up to you. If you're using some kind of a platform, kind of how we are, where you had to register to come in, then it'll be a little more obvious. Um, but you know, at, at the end of the day, use your best professional judgment. Um, you know, we, we are still trying to gather something, but we are not looking at these statistics under a fine microscope, so to speak. Um, you know, our hope is that this will, even though right now it's, it's such a new concept, um, and it looks like, you know, well, and you are, you are submitting more numbers than you have in the past for different types of programming. My hope is that once everybody has a chance to really kind of think about this, maybe review the PowerPoint, ask questions, and, you know, everyone has a chance to digest what, what these changes are, that it will actually make things a little bit easier for you in the long run. Um, yeah. And so again, you know, right now we we kind of went into this knowing that there were going to be a lot of questions and probably some uncertainty. Um, and these are all things that we have batted around as well the last few weeks talking about these. Um, so if you're still kind of uncertain about some some things, it's okay. At the end of the day, we trust you all to use your best judgment. What is gonna work best for you? What is gonna work best for your community? And just be consistent in whatever you decide to do. So if you decide you wanna do Google signups for live events, um, I would just recommend that you do that for all of your live events instead of switching it up halfway through. So that way you're at least counting everything the same way every time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and I know there's okay. been some talk about, you know, sometimes hundreds of people can can watch these videos and we're we're anticipating that, you know, we're anticipating that if you had just been having a run of the mill program in your library, you might have had 50 people show up. But if you're doing a live story time, you know, you might have 300. So we, you know, we're not going to think twice if we're seeing these virtual live programming numbers you know, that they are really high. We're sort of expecting that. 
so I see uh, another question here, Casey. Does it count for recordings posted before summer but are still being viewed during the summer? Or do they have to be posted just during the summer? So they have to be related to the summer reading program. And we actually talk about this. I'm actually going to scooch ahead one more slide. <laughs> Um, so this is only for summer reading program, and this isn't any different than if you all were still having programs in your library face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, a lot of libraries, there are just regular programs that they keep up throughout the summer, but they're not necessarily related to the summer reading program. So, you know, if you have your knitting group that meets every week in the library and they are now meeting through a face-to-face -face Zoom call every week just so they can socialize and come together and the library is hosting that, that's not a summer reading program. Um, and so even though we're looking at a lot more virtual programming, that framework still applies where it, it has to be related to your summer reading program. And then we did get a question, will this be our stats going forward or just for summer? So as of right now, this is just the summer reading program statistics. I do know that there are, and Dolly can, she probably has much better um, perspective on this than I do. I know that there are conversations happening with the national, on the national level, and on the statewide level, um, but this this particular focus right now is just for summer reading. So, and and I can talk just a smidge about this. Um, so, summer reading. So, for in one thing, one of the questions is part of this question is will this be our stats going forward or just for summer? And I want to say. It, I think this is going to be our stats going forward for summer. I think we're going to continue this on, especially if it works really well and people really like the virtual and being able to do self-directed virtual and self-directed um, non-virtual and active virtual and active face-to-face. -face. I mean, I think it gives us more bang for our buck across the board, and I think we're going to continue this for summer reading moving forward. So specifically summer reading. So expect to see the same kind of thing for next year's summer reading program as well, not just this year's. So that's good news, I think. Now, um, for the state collection of the entire public library statistics or for our annual statistics report, we'll be able to collect active programming virtual or not virtual. So we'll be able to do that, but we're not gonna necessarily, and we're gonna work on it, but we can't do it this year um, to do the self-directed programming for the, the entire public library's high level statistics. If, if that makes sense, Amy, just trying to answer that question, not related to summer reading. So in the interest of time, I do want to make sure that we are moving forward. Um, and, and just a reminder, we are also having another live question and answer next week. Uh, there were a lot of people who were unable to get into this webinar because it filled up so fast. Um, and then, of course, we're always available by email. So, um, you know, if you continue to have questions, please feel free to reach out. I do want to make sure that we are able to get through all of the material we have, so I am going to move us along. Um, also, not different from years past, when it comes to how you count your statistics, uh, you base it on the intended age for that program, not the age of attendees. So even if you were having a face-to-face -to -face toddler story time, you know, and you have 15 toddlers and 15 adults show up, you count 30 people under your your early literacy statistics. You don't separate them out. That's the same for any virtual programming as well. Um, so you don't have to worry about not being able to see the ages of your virtual attendees. It's just gonna be whatever the, 
you know, intended audience was meant to be. So outreach, I know we had a question pop up a little bit earlier about being able to start counting statistics um, before your actual summer reading. And so I think what that was referring to was outreach. So yes, you can count outreach activities. And we know that many of you were unable to get out into your communities for your typical outreach activities. Um, a lot of library staff go to schools and daycares and community events, but there are still ways for you to count virtual outreach activities. So for example, you know, if your team decided to live stream a skit promoting your summer reading program, that's considered an outreach activity. You would count it the same way as your program activities. Um, so if it's a live video, you count that for as an active program. And then if there are 300 people that watch your video after, after it's live in the post live, then that's self-directed. Um, so, you know, again, that's not really different from years past that you can count those outreach activities. It's just virtual outreach versus face-to-face. -face. Um, I do want to take a minute though and talk about the difference between outreach and marketing. We don't collect marketing statistics as, as part of our summer reading program statistics. You may decide on a local level that the, those numbers are important to you and you can use them, but we don't need them at the state and federal level. So what does that look like in our digital world right now and what's the difference? Um, you know, an outreach activity is something that you could easily do in a face-to-face -face setting in front of a group. You know, again, going back to that themed skit or creating a live commercial or doing a, a themed story time and then talking about your summer reading program, that's outreach because you could easily be doing that standing in a classroom, standing in a cafeteria. Um, things like creating digital flyers to put on your social media, creating Facebook events or sending out e-newsletters, that is really more marketing. And so we're not really collecting those statistics. Um, so, you know, because again, whenever you hand out bookmarks, we don't get those. We don't ask for the number of flyers you put up around town. It's really those, those events where you could easily be doing them face to face. And that is where there's no set date to begin. So if you started doing that three weeks ago for your library, I know I follow a lot of libraries on Facebook and I've started seeing um, a lot of these outreach and these videos um, now that libraries are starting to come up with a plan, um, they can start counting those now. And um, just to re reiterate, they are counted the same way as your program statistics. So if you're doing a live outreach activity on your social media, you would count that as an active. If it's something pre-recorded, then you could count that as a self-directed. And if your head is spinning right now, take a deep breath. <laughs> we are happy to answer questions. Um, and again, if you kind of need to digest some of this, then we completely understand. I did get a question about um, publishers extending permissions. I, I have no idea. I'm paying attention. I'm watching that. Um, but I that's sort of outside my my area of, of control, so to speak. Um, I think we'll just have to wait and see. I know that we've shared a pretty comprehensive Google Doc that somebody in another state started um, that youth services library staff have been adding to from all over the country. Um, so yeah, I think there's probably, someone said ALA and OCLC are keeping tabs on that too. So I think, yeah, just, just make sure that any, any live streaming story times or anything of that nature, um, that we wanna make sure that we're all following copyright and not violating anything. 
Um, I've seen conversations about libraries doing, um, you know, drive-in movies and things like that. So all, you know, all copyright <laughs> rules and regulations apply. Um, and just a reminder, if because we I know we do have some people who keep popping out and in, this will be recorded and uploaded, so you can always go back. Um, Yes, Amanda, I sent it out in one of my flip forwards and I can send it out again whenever I send the follow up email to this with the video. It is really handy. It's so handy that I even put it in my son's school's PTO's Facebook page. <laughs> So we're going to keep moving forward because, again, I want to make sure that we get everybody at least the content on time. Yeah, and, and if we've got, we will hopefully have some time let, left at the end for more questions. Um, but right now, the next section is to hear about counting opinions. And counting opinions is the online web-based system that we use to collect your statistics. If you're new to this, um, don't worry, you don't have to download anything onto your computer. You can access Counting Opinions on the web, and the URL is, but I'm bump next slide, fl.countingopinions.com. <laughs> so, um, and I think I'll just move on to the next slide. So, there's only one login for each location. And uh, Casey, do you want to talk a little bit about how they're going to get their logins? Sure. Um, so if you are your library's um, point of contact for statistics, I will send you an email that will have your username, your password, and the website. So if you didn't get it written, written down a minute ago, don't worry, you're going to get it again. Um, I am currently going through checking all of the logins because I know we had some login uh, snafus <laughs> last last year. Um, so I'm going to email those out. I will send them to that point of contact and then I will also CC the director on that information just because I'm a firm believer that important information should never sit with just one person because if anybody wins the lottery and disappears, we want to make sure that there, somebody else has access to that information. Um, that being said though, other than the director and the person responsible for putting in that, those statistics, it is important that the information is kept confidential because again, it is a username and a password. And if you've not received that information by July 3rd, please make sure you reach out to me after you check your spam folder. So, and there is only one login for each location. And so if someone who comes in and is using that username and password, say after you've put yours in, they can overwrite the information that's already entered. Um, or if you have multiple branches or several summer reading coordinators because you're in a really big system, um, you want to be sure to combine all of your summer reading statistics and report them in a, in a single total because this particular uh, survey does not allow for multiple branches of the same system being able to put in information. Um, you know, one, one youth library service person from a, a different branch could overwrite what you've put in uh, and then we would get kind of skewed statistics. So you'll want to be sure you Combine all your summary reading statistics and report them as a total when you put them put them in. And Dolly, there's a question that I'm going to pose to you okay. in the chat. Will you still be having us file one report for an entire cooperative, or will you want each member library to fill out one online? You give us our allotment at the cooperative level, so in the past we have just filled out one report for FLIP. Ah, you know or what? I <laughs> I was going to say, I honestly think that depends on how Casey sends out the login. It, so, honestly, Gladys, that is a local decision. I have some yeah. cooperatives who each submit separately and then they each get their, because um, a cooperative is different than a library system. 
So, um, well, in some cases it is. Yeah. So, like for yeah. instance, you know, here in Leon County, you know, we've got our our Leon County Library system that's got multiple branches. They submit all together. Um, but in my in in the Panhandle, you know, I have three counties that are a cooperative but they have each chosen to submit their statistics individually and then they receive their allotments individually um, and then i've got some cooperatives that choose to do it together um, so it really sort of depends on what you want to do within your cooperative i just need to know that so that we can make sure that we get everything set up accordingly Okay, so I'm actually looking. Why don't I get back to you specifically on that, uh, Gladys, and see how we have you set up in this system. I was just about to do that quickly, but I think I don't have time right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. Let's So when you put in that URL, you are going to end up here on our login page. And then when you log in, I'm pretty sure you'll get to this one and click enter. Um, and I will say, and Casey, Casey has noticed this, that if when you click this enter screen and you don't get to the flip CSLP annual statistical report, um, you probably need to clear your cache, right, Casey? Yes, um, I've noticed just because I've tested different logins, um, that if you've had to log in using a different login, so if you do, you know, if you are the statistics person, period, not just you services statistics, um, sometimes the system can get stuck. And so you want to look up there at that collection and make sure you're looking at the FLIP CSLP annual statistical report. And if it's saying it's the annual statistical report, you can either try using a different browser or, um, or clearing your cache and then logging back in and it should fix it. So, and when you look at the, the screen on this, uh, on this screen, you'll see at the top, it says data input. And on the uh, left-hand side, it says flip CSLP annual statistical report. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see a little circle that's red and it has 2019. You might notice that on 2019, that's not the year that we're actually collecting statistics for. So yeah, one more time, you might have to do a bit of a refresh. And the way you do this one is you um, do, that's a drop down. it's a little drop down menu. And you just click open the drop down menu and choose 2020. And that should refresh, or when you do refresh it, you should be able to, get to the uh, the next screen, which looks a lot like this. So instead of having numbers inside the boxes, you'll have nice clear boxes that you can fill out and then have little numbers next to the boxes that are from last year's statistics. And you'll see where we've got our active programming statistics separated out from the self-directed. Um, but this is also an area where there has been a change from years previous. So you'll notice that we've actually divided the age groups up differently than they've been divided in years past. Um, and we did this because this actually puts us more in alignment with what IMLS is asking from us. So, um, we are collecting for early literacy, zero to five, school age, six to 11, young adult, 12 to 18, and then adult is anything for 19 and older, and then our, our, our all ages programming. I know that sometimes programming can sort of fall in between some of these. If you get to that, you know, 11 to 13 type age, again, use your, use your best 
professional judgment there. Um, you know, we're not going to come in and ask you to justify why a program was this age group and not this age group. So you just want to be consistent. It also means that whenever you log in, you're not going to see anything next to that school aged box because it's a new statistic for this year. Um, and so if there's a blank spot there, don't worry, nothing's broken. <laughs> it's supposed to be that way. And that's actually the same for the next section. So when you get in, you're going to scroll down, you're going to see a whole brand new section that has no statistics for last year at all, because this is the self-directed programs area. Um, and the self-directed programs mirror the, mirror the active programs, the age groups are the same. Um, and, and we do say uh, self-directed attendees, that's very generic, don't, don't take that literally. We, we realize that if someone downloads a PDF and, and uses you know, the coloring sheets you provide, that's not necessarily an attendee, um, but we couldn't put in great long you know, attendees or downloaders or viewers or blah, 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 blah. So we just use the word attendees and just kind of take it as someone who accesses your self-directed program. Does that make sense? This section is pretty similar to uh, what it's been in the years past. Um, no, no big changes here. Um, the, the one change we did add is we added that question at the very bottom, um, just asking if you, um, you know, either did not use a resource or that you didn't find that it helped you improve. Um, let us know why. Um, that box looks really, really small, but it's kind of like Mary Poppins bag. It will grow as you type into it. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that the resources we're providing to you are as helpful as they can be. And so this is an opportunity for us to find out if there are other resources out there that we should be looking at because they work better for you all. Or if there are things that we're not providing that we could be providing, um, that information is really, really helpful for me. So we know that you're going to be doing things a little differently this year, and we want to know what it is you've done differently this year. What new things did you try? What changes did you make? So there's a whole section just for what did you do differently, and then there's a whole different section for success stories. Uh, what, what, you, what went really, really well? What sort of things would you like for us to tell IMLS that we're doing in Florida that you've done super duper well? We're never really the folks who toot our own horns well. You know, we, we just go along every day thinking all we're doing is normal everyday things. And yet we are doing amazing things here in Florida and we want to hear those success stories. So two separate boxes. One is what are you doing differently? And the other one is what went super duper well. And the next question, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is one that we've asked before, but it has been tweaked just ever so slightly. Uh, what needs have you identified in your community and how can we assist you in meeting those needs? So while you are gathering this information during summer reading program, it could be that some of these needs are year long needs. And so there are things that we can be doing on a rolling basis to help you meet those that information is really valuable to me at any given time not just during you know filling out the statistics because you know flip is only helpful if it's helpful to you all and so the best way for me to make sure that i'm meeting your needs is for you all to tell me um and for those who have been around uh for more than a few months you know that there was a, a big shift moving into this summer reading program um, with materials and that CSLP took over that process and created their own shop. And we have been trying to share information back with them and give them feedback because they want to continue to improve. Um, and I know that one thing I heard a lot of was that there were certain materials that have been available in years past that were not available this year, even pre-artwork. Um, recall and so 
I've shared with them anything that's been given me to me up to this point, but um, again, any anything else you all can think of for me to share with them, please feel free to put it in here. And then if there's just anything else you want us to know, um, again, to help us improve, or if there's things we're doing that you like, and we know this year has been a little different, just going through, you know, transition between um, you know, Jana and me and changes with CSLP and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and then I got a question, any consideration of the iRead program two years in a row with artwork that needed to be edited? So I, I'm still sort of a baby in this program. I've had a couple people ask me about it, Amy. Um, I just need time to do more research. I, you know, I stepped into this position um, right after Jana retired and it was already, you know, we were moving into the summer reading order. And so it's probably gonna take me a little time to really be able to give that the consideration it needs. Um, I just have to, I have to learn more before I could make any kind of a big jump. I don't know that we would be able to fund both um, just cause like everybody else, you know, we have limited federal funding as well. Um, I do know that CSLP is putting in additional steps moving forward to hopefully prevent what has happened from happening in the future. Um, but again, not opposed. I just need time to to be able to really focus on it. And things have been moving so fast that that I just I have not had the ability to really give it the time it needs. Okay, I'm looking at the time, so I think maybe moving on. Yes. Yeah. Just because. So, real quickly, um, there is a save button at the bottom of the page when you go into uh, counting opinions and you'll be able to save anytime you don't have to fill counting opinions out all at one point you can save your work and come back to it later um, but when you once you finish entering your data and saving it and you're ready to give it to us save is not the same thing as submit so you'll need to actually save it and then hit that submit button there's a submit button at the top of the page as you can see by the arrow, but there's also one at the bottom of the page, which is right next to save. Um, so you might accidentally hit the submit button instead of the save button. If you do that, don't panic. Let let either Casey or I know, and we can un unlock it for you. We don't need to, because what happens is submit's gonna lock it and then no one can go in and change it after you. So just let us know, we'll unlock it. You can go back to, to editing and putting in information. Um, but once you're done, once you're all finished and everything's all, all uh, totted up and you've got your last YouTube statistic just before you want to put your information in, finished everything up, go ahead and click that submit button and then uh, your report will get locked and we'll know that you're done and, and we're ready. We can, we can take a look at it and see what happens. But if you do accidentally hit that submit button too soon, you can contact one of us and we'll unlock it right up until that final due date. Which is August 17th, 2020. Um, we're gonna open the survey in the middle of July. Um, I know that many people are used to having until earlier middle September to submit their statistics. Um, but with the changes with the materials, we wanna make sure that you all can start ordering as soon as the shop opens, because we all know that the, the sooner you order, the more likely you are to get the things that you want and the quicker they get to you. And so the survey will be closing August 17th. Um, I will send plenty of reminders to make sure that nobody forgets. Um, I do recommend that when that survey opens, that at some point you take your login information and you log in just to make sure everything looks as it should. Um, I'm testing them, but sometimes tech has a mind of its own. Uh, so we wanna make sure that you know, you're know you not having a problem at nine o'clock on August 17th and you can't reach anybody to help fix it. 
So Casey, there is a question. What are the dates for the summer reading program itself? Is there a specific endpoint? No. Nope. Um, it's really, it can vary depending on your area. Um, you know, I know some libraries, they do it for a month and a half. Some libraries do it for a month. Some go from the last day of school until a few days before school starts back. So um, it really just, it, that's a local decision. I mean, now if you're still counting it in, you know, October, we might have questions. <laughs> um, So we are at 3.04, um, and so we have definitely used up our hour, which does not surprise me. Does that surprise you, Dolly? It doesn't, no. No, it's just a, a lot of new stuff to, to cover this year, a lot of new things. It is, and again, we are going to have another live Q&A next week. We are gonna send out the video, we're gonna send out the PowerPoint, and I'm working on sort of a cheat sheet that's just a one pager of the stats that you can print out and have on hand um, as well. Um, but again, any questions, please feel free. Um, please join us for our virtual brainstorming sessions. It'll be a great time to get together and sort of take this new self-directed language and think about how programming fits into those. Um, so thank you everybody. We're certainly happy to stay on. If anyone wants to continue, we're happy to stay on and answer more questions. Um, so don't, don't feel like you have to leave, but certainly feel free to leave if you've got other places you need to go. I have a question regarding the program we're using and the stats. Yes. And okay, so we've got a yes. first one with Amy Jane McWilliam. Do you want to start with Amy? Yes. Sure. Amy, I have unmuted you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So we're using Read Squared, and in Read Squared, you're able to set up missions. So we've created weekly missions, and each mission there are five activities and kids need to complete at least three of them to like win points and earn a badge and all that stuff right mm -hmm. so the activities are things like go on a scavenger hunt you know pick up litter around your neighborhood there are activities that they're doing would mm -hmm. those be considered self-directed we'll have very specific statistics because re because they have to mark when they're com when they've completed it mm -hmm. so um would those count as self-directed activities? Yes, those are self-directed. I would call those self-directed interactive activities because they're out doing things and probably, um, but they're doing it on their own. You're not, you're not actually with them. You're not actually guiding them as they do it as a live program director. They're doing it on their own. So that would be self-directed for them. Okay, okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. We did get a question too. Um, I plan to premiere Facebook videos. It is the same as a live stream, but I'm pre-recording. Is that still active? It's scheduled and Facebook treats it as a live video. Um, if you are not actively going live, then it would be considered self-directed. It might be interactive if you're still chatting along the way and Facebook might pull those stats as though it is live, but this but library staff you all are not actually live right there oh, i'm going to jump in i think it depends if okay. if it's a if it's a pre-recorded video but you are actively chatting and interacting with folks the pre-recorded part is self so if it's a special time like so you pre-recorded it you put it up at two o'clock and you have to be there live to answer questions, then the fact that you have to be there to answer questions means it's an active program. Yeah, but I think but if, if you're it, just if you're just scheduling the video, if you're just scheduling the video, and you're not there. Yes, then that would be self-directed. Yeah, did that help, Amy? Okay, great.
I think the biggest difference between a self-directed program and an active program is if you as a library staff person, if you have to be there to push buttons, answer questions, um, interact somehow, do a puppet show, move things, if you have to be there, if you have to be there, then it's an active program. Mm -hmm. But if it's posted in such a way that you can like walk away from it, go get yourself a cup of coffee, read a book, and then go for a bike ride. Go for a bike ride, yeah. <laughs> um, and and, and the, the audience can say, well, we're gonna go in at two o'clock, but we might wait till 2.15 and we're still not gonna miss anything, but we'll just start at the beginning because we push, push play on our own, then, the, then that would be definitely a self-directed program. So that's the, I said, I, I'm not sure if that's gonna help at all, but if you have to be there, it's active. If you don't have to be there, for that program to run anyway, then that would be self-directed. 